I've got a joke for you. You have no faith in me? Once upon a time, there was a church potluck. As part of the church potluck, somebody brought some apples and they put them on one end of the table. They put a sign underneath them. So they wanted to make sure there was enough for everybody. So they put a sign. They said, please only take one apple. God is watching. (laughs) On the other end of the table, there was a big pile of cookies. And one of the kids put their own sign underneath the cookies and said, here's some cookies, take as much as you want. God's watching the apples. (laughs) It starts at a very young age, okay? It starts at a young age. And those of you that have kids, you understand this, right? People ever get to the place where they don't believe in the doctrine of original sin, meaning that we were sinful at birth, right? From the time my mother conceived me, I was sinful. All you got to do is have a kid, and then you know that this is the case. Man, kids do things, and we don't have to teach them. We don't have to teach them that. I've told you guys this before. I didn't have to teach teach my son how to run over his sister with a semi-truck. I did not have to teach him that. I have to teach him not to do that, right? Well, man, just then... There's a little sweet girl comes along. Yeah, a little sweet girl comes along, a little bow in her hair and everything. And I don't like it when my kids mess with the light switches, right? You know, you with me on that? I don't love it, right? And so I'm like, don't mess with the light switches. And I just thought, well, this is a Lincoln rule, and we'll wait to institute it with Kennedy until she can actually reach the light switches because she's a little fry right now. And so uh, yesterday morning, my son and I are in the kitchen, and we're making breakfast. We're making pancakes, right? Love pancakes. So we're making pancakes, and all of a sudden, the lights in the kitchen begin to flicker. And I'm thinking, is something wrong with the electrical? Like, I don't understand what's happening. My son is next to me. He would usually be the culprit. My wife is asleep. I'm here. That leaves only one. And so I mosey on over to uh, the light switch, which is, you know, it's one of those three-way switches on the other side inside the dining room, and I see this scene. My daughter, my one-year-old daughter, has pushed one of the dining room tables all the way across the room over to right underneath the light switch, got herself up onto the chair and is standing on the light switch on her tippy toes, grabbing the light switch and going, And I looked at her and I said, Kennedy. And she looked at me and goes, <laughs> Why do we sin? Why do we do things that we're not supposed to do? Right? We know this. We know that we're not supposed to do it, and yet we do it, right? Sometimes we end up in a place where we're doing something and uh, we're not supposed to do it, but we don't know that we're not supposed to do it, and then we learn and make a correction. But for the most part, for you and me and my trouble, your trouble, is we know we're not supposed to, and yet we do. And, and this is the situation I want to talk about today. You say, wow, I thought we were in a series on joy. Yes, we are in a series on joy, how to fight for joy. Okay, week one, we talked about the reality that joy is not an option for a believer. We've got to fight for supernatural joy, right? That is something that is so important for us to do. We cannot, absolutely cannot leave out joy in the Christian life. And if we do, we are not living the Christian life as God intended it. So we have to fight for it. Week two, we talked about the fact that we have to get supernatural joy by catching it from the most joyful person in the universe. That's God himself being in proximity to him. Close proximity to God is so important. This week, the title of the sermon is The Greatest Joy Killer because I want to talk to you today about the fact that sin is the greatest joy killer in the world. It's not circumstances. Circumstances are not the greatest joy killer. They, they, can, they can present a danger to joy, right? 
It's not that. It's not circumstances. It's not other people. It's our own sin. As the greatest killer of joy, and here's why. Look at number one in your notes. Sin makes us miserable. Sin makes us miserable. And you say, well, yes, I know that. I think we kind of know that intuitively, but also then it presents this problem that I just talked about. And why do we still do it? <laughs> right? Why do we still do it? Well, we're sinful people, and there's an unexplainable mystery to that. Yes, that's true. But also, there's some simplicity to this that we have to recognize, right? Look at number one there. We sin because we believe that it will make us happy. We are wrong, okay? We sin because we believe that it will make us happy. Why do we do things we know we're not supposed to do? Why do we do things that God does not want us to do? Why do we do this? And we do. Okay? Yes, there's a mystery to it. I have a sin nature and so do you. And so there's a mystery to that. And we have to recognize that, yes, I'm drawn to something that I shouldn't be drawn to. That's a part of this. But also we have to recognize this very human, very real part, which is, man, we go after sin because we think it's going to make us happy, feel good. Absolutely no one thinks I'm going to do this my own way and not God's way because I know I'll end up miserable in the end. Nobody does that. If we're making a choice, I'm going to do this my way as opposed to God's way, it's because I perceive that my way will end up better for me in the end, that it'll be happier, more fulfilling. And we are absolutely wrong about that, right? This is all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 3. This has been the same thing. It's explained the same way. Why do we do this? Three reasons we sin, just really quickly. Number one, to feel something good. Two, to have something good. Or three, to be someone significant. That's why we sin, to feel something good, to have something good, or to be significant. These are why, this is the reason why we sin. Everything else falls under all those categories. That's why we do it. In other words, we do it because we think it's going to make us happy. We're wrong about this. So here's the line over to what we're talking about today. Look at number two in your notes. If we tend to be predominantly grumpy, and I'm using that word as the opposite of joyful, okay? Just because I think we can all identify with it. You know what I mean when I say grumpy? <laughs> Don't look at people. Don't. <laughs> I just saw at least 20 of you. It's like, oh, you know what I mean? You know what I mean when I say grumpy? I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Though I'm sorry I wasn't looking at you, honey. I was looking at something over there. Yes, that's what I'm using, okay? If we tend to be predominantly grumpy, predominantly grumpy. Unrepentant sin is likely at the root of the problem. You hear me? If we tend to be predominantly grumpy, unrepentant sin is likely at the root of the problem because sin makes us miserable. Selfish people are miserable. We go after selfishness because we think it's going to make us feel good, that we'll have good things, that we will be important or significant, that we will be happier, and we're wrong about this. We're wrong because at the end, it all turns to ash in our mouths. Adam and Eve bit the fruit, and how did that go? They feel great about it? Man, we are so glad we did this. No. No. They're miserable, and you and I so often, man, we got a problem. It's like, I can't be joyful. I don't know why. Like, joy is not happening in my life. Unrepentant sin may very well be at the root of the problem. Here's some classic joy-killing culprits for you. Um, Bad language. God doesn't want us to use vulgar language. Many of us, we've never bothered to focus on or do any kind of work to clean up the language that we use. Well, that's unrepentant sin. It's just happening all the time. We're just okay with it, right? There are sins that we've just become okay with. I did this a little while ago with worry. We've just given up the fight on worry. We've just decided worry is okay. We're going to worry because there's worrisome things in life, and I'm going to worry all day and call it concern, and that's it. That's, we've done this. 
Same thing with things like bad language. What about entertainment choices? All right, Scripture says, don't put anything worthless before my eyes. And yet so many of us with our entertainment choices, this is exactly what we're doing. We're watching shows on streaming services that have nudity in them just because it's okay. It's culturally acceptable. It's not. Right? And some of this stuff is up to wisdom, but some of it is just up to clear Christian common sense. Shouldn't be watching Game of Thrones. Right? Things like that. It's culturally acceptable, yet it's, it's not. It just isn't. And, and then we, we, be, we become okay with these things in our lives We wonder why we struggle with joy. Because we're actively living in a way God doesn't want us to live. What about just letting our minds go with sexual fantasy? Well, so I'm not actually doing anything about it. It's just in my mind. That's sin. That's sin. And we don't repent of it. Maybe we feel badly about it in the moment. We might even ask God to forgive us of it in the moment. But we don't actually repent of the sin. And that's going to be a problem. Look at worry. I just said it. What about complaining? Greed. Not serving the church. That's wrong. Yet we come okay with it. Not loving our neighbor, meaning those that those we don't like. Neighbors that are not like us, right? This is this is all wrong. All of it is sin in scripture. What about being judgmental? I'm here, they're here. See, these are things that they're they're classic joy-killing culprits of sin in our lives because they tend to be sin that that we just kind of leave there and and we don't go after it. And the truth of it is we're going to be joyful people. We need to be people who hunt down and kill sin in our lives. Hunt it down and kill it. And some of this stuff is present in our lives and we're not even totally aware of it because we've never even gone to the Lord and said, Lord, search me and know my thoughts and prayed the prayer of Psalm 139. Search me and know my thoughts. And if there's any offensive way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Why? Because I want to be a joyful Jesus follower. I want to go after it. So we're going to help with that today. Okay. I want you to imagine that your relationship with God is like a pipeline. Okay. It's like a pipeline. Your connection with God Sin, unrepentant sin that just lives there mucks up the pipeline. It's true. In Psalm 66, verse 18, it says this, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And that word for cherished, by the way, is the exact same Hebrew word that is used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when it says, the woman saw the fruit, she saw that it was good. Saw is the same word as cherished, and it means that I want the benefit of whatever that sin is more than I want to avoid the consequences. And that's what happens with us. Well, that kind of thing mucks up the pipeline, and we should not expect to be joyful or to have supernatural joy that's present even in trials because we have to go after the sin in our lives. So, you ready to do this? Right? We want to be people who know how to really repent. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to go to Psalm 51 to do it. Psalm chapter 51. I'm just going to read it. Then we're going to go, okay? I'm going to read it. Psalm chapter 51. Love that sound. Open up God's word, get it in front of our faces. This is the the psalm written by David upon the occasion in which he was convicted of his sin with Bathsheba. Adultery, murder, cover up. Very bad. And this is his response. Look at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. 
and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. We're for life here. God's doing things even in the womb. See, there's one of your texts right there. Verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear, what's that word? Joy. You see? What has sin stolen from him? Joy. Let me hear joy and gladness. He wants it again, but he doesn't have it. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the, read that word, joy of your salvation. This is what he's after. He doesn't have it and he's after it. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. That's real. That's a real line right there. I arranged to have someone murdered. Okay? Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar, is the word of the Lord in Psalm 51. And here we have almost a road map for real repentance. So let's do this in the notes. Here we go. Number two, repentance clears the path for supernatural joy. You see that he's after this? He says, let me hear joy and gladness because it's escaped me. In the midst of the sin in my life that has gone unrepented, the sin that has just festered and lived there, I've lost my grip on joy. And he's saying, I want to hear it again. I want to have it again. Well, this is what we learned from this. Repentance clears the path for supernatural joy. Again, our relationship with God is like a pipeline. And sin that sits there, unrepented of, mucks up that pipeline. And we're going to feel it after a little while. That's absolutely true. So what is repentance then? Here we go. This is what it is. Number one, repentance is a change of mind and heart that leads to a change of behavior. It's a change of mind and heart that leads to a change in behavior. That's what it is. Something's got to change in my mind. Something's got to change in my heart. And something's got to change in what I do. That's why scripture talks about repentance as being a turn. This, by the way, uh, if you look at the gospels, especially in the gospel of Mark, this is the first thing that Jesus says in his ministry. It's the very first thing. He goes out there and says, hey, good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent is what he says. Turn. Leave the old life behind. This is real. And that's real repentance. So there's what this means. Look at number two there. The biggest barrier between us and joy is us. The biggest barrier between us and joy is us, okay? It's, 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 not, <laughs> it's not the outside world, okay? It's not President Biden. It's not taxes. It's not the snow. And we might think that. If the snow were just gone, I'd be so joyful right now. No. It's not your kids. It's not the bank account. It's us. Greatest barrier between us and joy is us. So here we go. Number three, the characteristics. The characteristics of true repentance that pave the path for joy. The characteristics of true repentance that pave the path for joy. Number one, it begins with an unshakable confidence in God's unchanging character. It begins with an unshakable confidence in God's unchanging behavior. Let's go back to the psalm, Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. 
and according to your great compassion. David is recognizing here that if there's going to be forgiveness that occurs, if there's going to be restoration from this violation that has occurred, it's going to be not according to David's record, it's going to be according to what? God's character. And he's appealing to that, actually. He's appealing to it. Your unfailing love, according to your unfailing love and your great compassion, if there's going to be forgiveness and restoration here, that's why it's going to happen. Not because God looks at David and goes, well, most of the time you get it right. Most of the time. You're, you're, batting, you're batting like 800, okay? I know the 20% includes Bathsheba and adultery and murder and Uriah and all that stuff. But most of the time you get it right. Okay, David, okay. Yeah. Got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with his record. It's got nothing to do with what he did or didn't do or his achievements or his character or anything like that. It's got to do with the character of God. In fact, this is so interesting. In the Hebrew, in that first verse, it says, according to your unfailing love. That word is the Hebrew word hesed. Chesed, which means loving kindness, and it's, it's very specific. That is the covenantal word for God's love for his people. So it's interesting to me here that David is appealing to God for forgiveness and restoration from his sinful activity, and he's doing it using the covenantal word for God's love for his people. Um, in other words, uh, David is assuming that he's still in. He's assuming he's still in. He's saying, listen, I, I don't believe I have sinned my way out of your love and favor. And, and the same is true for us. If we're going to actually have the courage and the strength to turn from our sin in our lives in such a way that it clears the pipeline for joy to make its way down, if we're actually going to turn and do that, We've got to have an unshakable confidence in God's character. We've got to know that when I turn from my sin, I'm not going to be met with punitive, horrible wrath. No, because that fell on Jesus. I can repent and turn and know that I'm going to be met with God's loving kindness and grace. It's an unshakable confidence in God's unchanging character that's huge. It also means, by the way, that God at his deepest level, right, this word great compassion, God at his deepest level is someone who has great compassion even on sinners. This is who God is. And we've got to remember that and believe it wholeheartedly, right? An unshakable confidence in God's unchanging character. Look at number two. We start there and we keep going. Repentance, it continues when we recognize our sin for exactly what it is. We got to recognize our sin for exactly what it is. David's doing this. Okay? Look at verse 3. For I know my transgressions. What a statement that is. He says, I know them. He says, I know. I, it has been shown to me, and I know my transgressions. Right? My sin is always before me. And then look what he says here, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Okay, these verses right here is David recognizing his sin for exactly what it is. And he's not mincing words. And we got to do the same thing. I want to be people who are able to be joyful and not have sin that's mucking up the pipeline in my relationship with God. I need to be able to call my sin out for exactly what it is, but we don't do that. We use weak words, not strong words when we're talking about our sin. Sometimes we don't even say the word sin. We say, I've made a mistake. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we have not made a mistake. A mistake is when you turn in your paper and you've got a typo. Did you put the typo there intentionally? This will be fun. No. Right? That's a mistake. That, that's a mistake. A mistake is when you're building something, when you're building a shelf at home, and you measure, and then you cut, but your first measure was wrong. See? Measure twice. Cut once. Right? 
And you're like, I got to go back to the hardware store and get another piece of wood. Yep, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Sin is not a mistake. It's a choice. It's a decision. And we should talk about it like it is. And it's very important if we're going to really repent of sin that we have to use appropriate language. David is absolutely doing that. We've got to recognize our sin for exactly what it is, which means, here we go, number one, we must change our mind about our sin. We've got to change our mind about it. What do I mean? Look at what he says. He says, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge, right? This is the first step. We just got to say, what I did was wrong. What I did was wrong. It was wrong, Right? Period. I'm not using any other words to try and explain or bend or, or shade what I did in any particular way. No, I am saying I was wrong. God, you were right. I have rebelled against you. All right? This is what I mean when we change our mind about our sin. We also have to understand it for, for this. Look at number two. Sin is nothing less than betrayal and treason. Like that. Use like those words. This is what I'm saying. Sin is nothing less than betrayal and treason. Why do I use those two words? They're not interchangeable. Why? Betrayal is a personal thing. Treason is a legal thing. And both are true. I have betrayed God. And I have committed treason against the kingdom of God. Why? Because I've rebelled against him. And I've done things that he doesn't want done. He's the king of the universe. And I can't talk about it any other way except to say exactly what it is. He says, against you, verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. And this is what he means by that. He's saying, I have committed treason against you. I can't believe that I did that, but I did. This is what else he's saying. Look at verse 6 there, or verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know what he's saying here? He's saying my sin was committed in character. It was me. It was me. This is what we like to do with sin. We like to explain it. We like to say, well, here, but you don't understand. Like the situation was... Or here, here, this is how I was brought up, or this is how my parents treated me, or, or this is what happened around me, or don't you, this person pushed me to this place, and, and, and no, this, my, my, my wife has been so unloving for such a long time, and that you just don't understand that, that I've been so, I've been under the pressure I've been under. No. If I'm going to repent, my sin was committed in character. It was me. I didn't just suddenly, you know, black out and become somebody else is what I'd like it to be. Man, I don't even know. My emotions got the best of me. No, they didn't. It was you. And we got to say that. We have to treat it this way. Right? It's nothing less than betrayal and treason. And it was committed in character. We got to use the words that God uses. Right? The, the New Testament word, the Greek word for confess is homologeo. Homo meaning comes from the same thing. Legeo meanings saying the words. It means saying the same words. That's what confession means. I'm saying the same words that God would say about my sin. And God would say it's betrayal and treason. That's what he would say. He would use the strong words. We've got to do the same thing. Look at number three. We must deeply grieve the far-reaching consequences of our sin. Deeply grieve the far-reaching consequences of our sin. Look at verse 16, right? Skipping around the chapter a little bit, but that's why I, wrote, I read it at the beginning. Verse 16, David says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. And you say, well, that's kind of weird, because I thought that that's what they needed to do. I sin, and so I bring a sacrifice to God, and then we're good, Right? No, that's a God that you appease. That's not a God you have a, rela a covenantal relationship with. So he says, verse 17, my sacrifice, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. This is way more than sorry. He's saying when we sin, is more than sorry. Sorry, God. This is letting the reality of what I've done break my heart. The sacrifice that God is looking for. Do I understand what I did? 
Do I understand how it has affected him? Do I understand how it's affected everybody else? Okay. Here's a key part of this. Don't miss this in your notes. We need to teach our hearts who the real victims are. When it comes to our sin, we're going to repent. We got to teach our hearts who the real victims are. Here's what our sinful hearts want to do. I'm the victim. That's what my sinful heart wants to do. Even when I sin, when confronted with my sin, I want to say, I'm the victim. No, you don't understand. This is how I was treated. In my situation, you need to have done the same thing. No, the real victims. Number one, God. So we understand, we're, if we really want to repent in a way that clears the path for supernatural joy, if we want to do that, we got to understand that when we sin, we're not merely breaking God's rules. We're breaking his heart. We're breaking his heart. He made me. He wove me together in my mother's womb. He taught me faithfulness even in the womb. He's like, this is how you're going to live. You're going to be just like me. You're going to be a mini-me, Steve. You're going to walk around being just like me, and then you go do something like this, and it kills him. It kills God. You've got to understand that. He's the number one victim. So I said, against you and you only have I sinned, right? That's who we sin against. Also, number two, victim, everybody else around us. Sin always makes a mess. <laughs> it always makes a mess, and the people around us feel it. If I'm selfish, is my household going to know? Yes. They're going to know before I know that I'm selfish. I say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about this. That, that, that Look at what my sin has done. It has broken your heart. It has made life hard for those around me. And I am letting it break my heart. That's real repentance, right? Unshakable confidence in God's unchanging character. We recognize sin for exactly what it is. And we deeply grieve the far-reaching consequences of our sin. Do you see this? This is a change of mind. This is a change of heart. I'm letting my sin get to my heart and break it. Right? Here we go. Number four. Right? In true repentance, we must ask God to cleanse us and restore us. There's a part of this only God can do. We ask God to cleanse us and restore us. David does this, verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He's concerned about the right thing. He doesn't want to lose the relationship, which for him was possible. Right? Doesn't want to lose it. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So interesting that I could be a saved person, but if I go down a path of sin that has not changed yet, I'm not going to feel the joy of my salvation anymore. I'm not going to be a joyful person. I'm going to be a person who is rebellion, in rebellion against God. That's not a happy person. And he says, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He says, Lord, I want to turn from this sin, and I need you to help me want to stay on that path, because by myself, I'm not going to want to stay on that path. You've got to cleanse me and restore me. So we've got to ask him for it. Okay? True repentance. You've got to know who he is. Unshakable confidence in his character. We've got to call sin out for what it is. Recognize it for exactly what it is. Grieve the far-reaching consequences, right? Who's the real victim here of my sin? And ask him to cleanse us and restore us. Now here's number five, okay? Here's number five. You knew it was coming. Repentance reaches completion when we change the sinful behavior. We change it. <laughs> okay. Let's finish these up. Number one, repentance is not repentance without a change in behavior. It's not. It just isn't. If what I have done, if I'm not putting the wheels in motion to change that, I have not turned. I've not turned. And number two, if we don't make a plan to obey, we will not obey. So, here's the thing that's the good news, okay? Let me give you the good news. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can turn. Here's the most wonderful thing 
about our relationship with God, right? Yes, we end up with Him for eternity and not in hell. That's really good, okay? But if you're anything like me, one of the things that gets to me the most in living the Christian life is I get really, really tired of my sin, right? If you felt this, I get tired of my sin, and I get tired of the fact that I, I go back to certain things, though I've repented of them. Why? Because I'm, I'm a sinful person, right? I, I go back to those things and then repent, and I think, man, I've gotten victory over them. No, sometimes, here's, here's the thing, the life of a Christian is the life of repeated repentance. I'm going after it again and again and again, right? I'm going after it again and again and again, and one day, one day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have some more victory over that particular thing in my life. Not perfect, but better, because we can turn. We actually can do this. So, you know, we want to know where to start today. Here's where to start. Ask God to help you do it. Man, I've got this thing and I want to turn. I got to turn. I got to turn from this. I do not want to be a person who just worries and explains it away anymore. I want to not worry. You can help. God will help you with that. You think God's going to answer that prayer? Of course he's going to answer that prayer. Here's secondly. This is what I meant by make a plan. Make a plan. Intentions only lead us so far. Not very far. Many, many people intend to obey and never obey. But those who obey make a plan to obey. They say, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to my husband or my wife or my best friend or my brother or my sister, and I'm going to tell them about what I'm struggling with, and then we're going to make a plan together, and I'm going to have them ask me about it so I can stay on this path. Why? Because I want to be a person who hunts down and kills the sin in my life to please and glorify God and clear up the pipeline to actually know what it is to be joyful, to have the joy of my salvation restored. So, if you got something to turn from in here, God's making it clear right now. And I urge you to do it. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I know we can. And thereby continue to fight for the joy that he wants all of us to live with.